So I wonder how you feel about the Apostle Paul. Or more precisely, given that I doubt that any of us has ever had the pleasure of his company, I wonder how you feel about his writings, those probably seven letters of the New Testament that scholars now broadly agree were actually written by Paul himself. Well, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if I asked who feels somewhere between ambivalent and hostile to those epistles, I suspect it might be a fair number of you. I've heard a lot of people express their frustration or their dislike of Paul's writings, including a fair few people in active ministry. Now, the most recent person to share that frustration with me, as she has many times before, was my own dear mum, when we stayed with her last Sunday evening. Her church in Bath, St. Stephen's, up on the hill, is currently following a sermon series on the Old Testament. And my mum expressed her absolute delight at a few weeks off from Paul. It's a view that I suspect is widely held in congregations up and down the country. So why do many people have at best a love-hate relationship with Paul? And why are some people entirely put off by his teachings? Well, many simply feel excluded by the views that he seems to express. I haven't done a survey, but I am pretty sure that most of those who have expressed their dislike of Paul to me are women. Rather unsurprising, perhaps, given his pronouncements in 1 Corinthians on the role of women in the church. At least two of the so-called clobber verses, there are six of them, that have been used to persecute people from the LGBT community come from Paul's letters. And the historic use of parts of Ephesians and Colossians to justify slavery unsurprisingly makes Paul's writings really hard to engage with by people of colour. A few years ago, the Baptist minister and founder of Oasis, Steve Chalk, wrote a book called The Lost Message of Paul, in which he seeks to re-examine and rediscover Paul's writings. Now, Steve is the first to admit that the book doesn't represent his own scholarship, but instead it does what he is so good at doing in, uh, in expressing 60 years of emerging and very academic Pauline scholarship in some really big books into very attractive and accessible language, and if you haven't already read it, it's a book that I would highly recommend. Early in the book, Steve addresses how and why Paul's letters are so polarizing. Over the centuries, he argues, the writing of Paul has been weaponized. His words have been used to justify cruelty towards and exclusion of black people, people of color, women, people of other religions, the wrong sort of Christian people, Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, depending on your point of view, non-believers, and of LGBT people, to name but a few. So it is no surprise that countless Christians, aside from anyone else, feel ambivalent at best towards the apostle and his words. For too many, Steve says, He is the author of structural social exclusion. But that isn't all, I suspect. If we're honest, many of us can find Paul picky, pedantic perhaps, seemingly focused on creating rule upon rule. We can perhaps at times hear a voice that seems to lack a bit of humility and grace, something that can add to this idea that Paul is somehow the author of an aggressively patriarchal sort of church. 
And of course, we can often find Paul really quite hard to understand, perhaps an impenetrable puzzle for us at times, something that even his contemporaries recognized, as I noticed for the first time only last week. Because the author of 2 Peter, either Peter himself or his scribe or somebody writing shortly after his death, writes that Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Prophetic words indeed when we think of how Paul's writings have been used ever since. So how can we respond to Paul given all these challenges? Well, we can be tempted to avoid those bits of our Bibles altogether, to focus more on the Gospels and Jesus' teachings rather than Paul's epistles. Well, you probably won't be surprised to hear me say that I don't think that's the right answer. There is so much wisdom in Paul's writings that we should avoid the temptation to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But we do need to find some very practical ways to engage better with Pauline theology, and I've come up with three suggestions that I hope can help. Firstly, I think we need to be prepared to grapple with different translations, to overcome some of those issues of language and accessibility. The NIV and the NRSV are both relatively literal renderings of those epistles, and they result in those long and cumbersome sentences that we're all familiar with, and particularly if you read here on a Sunday morning, trying to work your way through those very hard sentences, that flowery rhetorical style can be a real challenge for us as we read it. So unless you're a Greek scholar, and I know we have one in this church at least, the meaning of a passage. And the Bible Gateway uh, website is great for that and for seeing different translations side by side. Secondly, it's important, I think, for us to look at a letter as a whole, as we did in our sermon series on 1 Thessalonians during the summer. That can help us to understand the context, perhaps with the help of a good commentary, but also to see the full flow of the letter's arguments. And again, a couple of great online resources for doing that are the Bible Project, which provides a really visual overview of each book of the Bible in literally 10 minutes or less. And Bible for Life, which has a whole range of resources designed to help you engage with the whole of a book at a time. And then thirdly and finally, it's important, I think, to try and distinguish between when Paul is writing systematic theology, so theology that's relevant to all Christians of all kinds, in all places and at all times. And when he's writing specific advice for those particular new churches in Rome or Corinth or Ephesus. Paul's writings contain a huge amount of very specific advice for those new church plants much of which was written in response to their questions and concerns. And we don't know what those precise questions were. And we lack a complete understanding now of some of that context. Although really good New Testament and historical scholarship is helping us to understand and unwrap that more and more. Again, as Steve Chalk suggests, Paul says different things to different churches in different situations at different times. So to decontextualize a specific point that he makes to a particular church, and then to try to turn it into a universal principle, applicable at all times, in all places, to all people, is to make a dangerous error, no matter how many preachers endorse it. 
And so the more we feel that Paul is being specific in his advice to a particular church in a particular context, the more I think we should feel the freedom to interpret it more loosely, and particularly where it's at odds either with what's written in the rest of that book or in the rest of the biblical canon, or indeed with our own lived Christian experience. And that's really incredibly important because, as I've said, there is far too much systemic life-enhancing wisdom in Paul's writings for us to simply hold our noses and turn away. And that's particularly true of his letter to the Romans, from which our first reading comes this morning. It was Paul's magnum opus, his letter to a divided church that he never visited, but which he knew where Gentile and Jewish Christians were at odds with each other. It's a book in which he lays out his understanding of the whole gospel message, and which is the culmination of 25 years of the most active ministry possible. Not for nothing do many of history's greatest Christian thinkers, people like Augustine, Luther, John Wesley, Karl Barth, profess the huge influence of this letter on their theology. And of course, when we do have a good look at what Paul is saying in this passage from chapter 13, we see that his theology is much more open, much more expansive, and much more inclusive than we typically give him credit for. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul, perceived by so many as a miserable, pedantic, pernickety, misogynistic rule bringer, is actually focused more on principles than on rules. In the light of Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection, Paul expresses so clearly and simply that love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is enough. Love is the only lens that matters. Love trumps rules. And in that context, I suspect that Paul himself would exhort us not to rigidly follow the nitty-gritty of one side of a 2,000-year-old dialogue between him and a fledgling church that had some very specific opportunities and challenges. I think he would find it profoundly odd for us to apply what he said to those individual churches to our deliberations about, say, the role of women in the church or how we should respond to loving and faithful same-sex relationships or indeed any other thorny theological or ecclesiological issues that confront us. I think he would encourage us simply to apply the lens of love. Because as Paul is making clear in this letter to the Romans, if it isn't of love, if it doesn't look like love, if it doesn't feel like love, then it isn't of God and it isn't of Jesus Christ. And of course that liberating, deeply principles-based approach to navigating both scripture and our daily lives brings a lot more clarity to what is otherwise a really challenging gospel reading this morning from Matthew. In it, Jesus gives his advice for his disciples about how to respond to sin and conflict in the early church. They are instructions that seem bafflingly and unrealistically simple if we consider the many things that Christians can disagree about in our churches today. 
But again, when we set aside the rules, the doctrine, the dogma, and focus instead on reconciling our differences through the lens of love, it all becomes a whole lot easier and this passage makes a lot more sense. We can all argue about what Paul does or doesn't say about slavery or the role of women in the church or same-sex relationships. We've been doing that, let's face it, for the best part of 2,000 years. But I don't think we can argue for long when we put the narrow and rigidly held rules to one side and simply apply love to the reconciliation of our differences. In the words of American pastor Joanne Lee, we're not called to be rule followers. We are called to experience and understand the deep love that undergirds and upholds the commandments of God. And by intimately being known and loved by our God, to then extend and share that love with the world. Breathtakingly simple. And yet for us flawed and mortal humans who find so much comfort in rules, so incredibly hard in practice. Amen. Right, ready for the notices, everyone. There's not too many. First one is we should hopefully have our wonderful motorised doors by the end of this week. So... um, That would just be magnificent. A huge thank you to everyone who has accommodated. Um, It's not been easy opening and closing up, so a huge thank you to everyone who's helped with that. Prayers as we start sparklers tomorrow, please. Um, Prayers for the people who help and prayers especially for our little babies and toddlers and their parents, grandparents and child minders, but if you can just hold us in your prayers tomorrow morning, that would be wonderful. Dates for your diaries, please. Um, Enter in on the Sunday, the 17th of September. We have our church walk. Please, if you need any more information, Michael and Carol are here. Please speak to them after the service. I do know it's a five-mile circular walk, but you can join it about halfway, but have a chat with them. Now, the second one is Friday the 22nd of September at 2 o'clock here in St. Mary's um, is Mary Pace's service of celebration for her life. And her family warmly invite anyone who knew Mary to please do come along and join them on the 22nd of September at 2 p.m. here at St. Mary's. Again, please hold Mary's daughters in your prayers tomorrow as we have a private um, funeral service. Mary's um, request that um, it's very, very close family. But that's at 1.45 tomorrow, so please do be praying for the family then. And that's it, you'll be pleased. No more notices. Just to say, remember to open your email updates, won't you please? And.